Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to Growers Daily, your daily dose of ecological farming insight. It is Monday, May 12th, uh, 2025. And today we're going to talk about what is biodiversity and why is it important? Should you ever let land just rest and how uh, the term regenerative may mean, well, not what people want it to mean. So let's do it. All right. Well, happy Monday, everyone. I hope you all have lovely weekends. Real quick, I have a question to start off today's show. Is anyone in this network of friends growing fiber hemp or cotton organically slash regeneratively on a decent scale? Hit us up at notillgrowers at gmail.com. If you are, we want to chat for a project we're working on. Uh, all right. Like I said, hope everyone had a nice weekend, especially you moms, at least here in the U.S., not Every country probably celebrates Mother's Day. They should. We celebrate all our mothers. So we hope you all had a great weekend. Uh, happy Mother's Day. Our weekend here was mostly soccer, which is fun. A lot of good hanging out with the family uh, and playing with the kids and sleeping past 2.50 a.m., which is a nice treat. Also, I like the weekends where I can just walk through the gardens and enjoy them. And I got to plant some flowers. It's really nice. Uh, the rye has really shot up and it's starting to flower. We're inching closer to the milk stage when the seed heads fill up with like a liquid and and the rye cover crop is ready to be terminated. That is coming up quickly. Also, the lacy phacelia, where I sowed it kind of late, is just now starting to flower. Soon, we will be terminating those cover crops, as I said. So I'll be keeping everyone updated on all that uh, as we get closer and closer to termination, which we will probably start discussing maybe next week or maybe later this week. We'll see. I'd like to keep you on your toes. So a question came up on our YouTube not that long ago from user Bayview5943, who asked if you should ever rest land. Now, I took this to mean, uh, should you ever let land kind of hang out with nothing growing on it? This is something that farmers call bear fallowing. It happens uh, quite often in larger scale operations where maybe at the end of the season, that farmer will harvest their corn or soybeans or whatever it may be, and uh, then just kind of let the soil stay sort of as is until the spring when they either disc it and or plant or spray it down and then plant if they're doing like what's called conventional no-till where you literally spray the crop ground with an herbicide you'll see this a lot of times if it's just like brown right now mysteriously and everything else around it is green they'll spray it with an herbicide and then they'll run what's called a seed drill through it and then they'll, that's when they plant their crop and although sometimes uh, to be fair to these growers this is just a matter of how late they are getting their main season crop out and how early they'll need their first crop for the next season meaning planting something else or even planting a cover crop may be tough uh, leaving the soil bare is not super great for soil on multiple levels though first leaving the soil unplanted means that it is highly exposed to erosion from wind and rain also as i want to say if the soil is not being fed it is feeding on itself meaning that if there is not energy coming into the soil through photosynthesis, plants, uh, the soil is going to eat the energy it has stored in the form of soil organic matter, which as we discussed last week, even happens under tarps to a surprising extent. So effectively, it's just eating its food storage. Now, when it's cold, uh, this loss happens more slowly, of course, but it still happens. Much like we store energy and fat, the soil stores it in soil organic matter in life and roots and the plants. So that can be a major issue with leaving the soil bare. Also, speaking of life, a lot of uh, soil microbiology is sustained by living plant roots. So when living plant roots are not present, that means those microbes can dramatically decrease in both population and diversity, which we will actually discuss a bit more about biodiversity in the next section. Even growing another cover crop over the winter, say wheat in a conventional system or garlic in a vegetable system is preferred. Indeed, even if you're just going to harvest it because of those living plants plant roots or at the very, very least a uh, mulch. Uh, so the soil has something to get it through the winter. It can eat it. It can keep the soil in place. Now, there is another form of resting the soil that is beneficial that has been practiced for millennia, which is just a basic form of fallowing that allows plants to grow for a few years to replenish the soil before reusing that ground again. Indigenous Americans have done this for thousands of years where depending on uh, the tribe and location, they may use a plot for a few years before letting it go out of production for a few years and then back into production later. We often rest our soils with cover crops with a similar goal where instead of growing crop we intend to harvest, we grow a crop we want just to feed the soil and then we terminate that in the spring and plant again into that same area. I've also taken plots out of production for a full year to simply cover crop those plots and fully replenish them. The results are almost always worth it in terms of production, though, of course, you're giving up that land for a full year, which is not super profitable, if you can guess. So the only way I ever suggest resting the soil is with other plants, though, obviously, 
again, sometimes a mulch can make a nice alternative. And if you must, like sometimes we do, a tarp uh, so the soil will at the very least stay put, also helpful. Anyway, thoughts on that or ways in which you use this idea? Let us know. Otherwise, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll talk biodiversity and why it is so darn important. BRB. Today's episode of Grows Daily is brought to you by Ring of Fire. What if you could turn your brush problem into black gold? The Ring of Fire Biochar Kiln is your spring tool for soil transformation, converting woody debris into high-quality biochar in just hours. Biochar will kickstart your compost, retain water and nutrients in your soil, and provide habitat for beneficial microbes. Now $19.95 with flat rate shipping, their spring sale runs through June. Don't wait to boost your soil and optimize your inputs. Visit ringoffire.earth slash growers now to learn more. Also, for more information on biochar, check out the No-Till Market Garden podcast interview with Kelpie Wilson, inventor of the Ring of Fire kiln, that we will link in the show notes. All right, back to the show. If you, the listener, are enjoying this podcast, getting even a small amount of value from it, consider supporting our work over at patreon.com slash no-till growers. I will try to get to questions from everywhere the questions come in but I will always get to your Patreon questions. Now, uh, today's Patreon question comes from Patreon member Blair Aiken, who writes, quote, Hi, Jesse, I am passionate about regenerative market gardening and have been learning so much from you and others the last few years, listening to your podcast as I work on the small farm I am part of. Sometimes I get lost in the terms folks use, and I realize after a while that I don't have a good grasp on what they really mean. I wish someone could sit down and explain to me like I'm a five-year-old, maybe we could start a new acronym, ELIAF. Explain it like I'm a five-year-old. It's good. I like that. Uh, for starters, may you ELIAF biodiversity, especially what it means for soil health. As always, profound thanks for your work and all the information and resources you offer, end quote. Okay, great. Thanks, Blair. Uh, love this. Thank you. A very fun question and a challenge. Uh, so biodiversity, what does it mean, especially in the context of soil and farming? Well, biodiversity is about like it sounds, bio meaning life and diversity mean lots and lots of different life. And we use the term in a few different sort of specific ways when it comes to farming. Uh, first, when we're talking about biodiversity in the soil, we may be talking about all the macro stuff that you can see like earthworms and pill bugs and mites and grubs and all the visible critters and creatures. Uh, we can also be referring to the variety of plant species in a given area. That may be part of the biodiversity. Uh, also, the microbes uh, that are in a given area could be part of the biodiversity. And of course, biodiversity can refer to the wildlife above as well. It's a sort of uh, somewhat of a catch-all phrase that is usually used to refer to all the life in a given area like the soil or above ground or both. Now, another term biodiversity gets lumped in with is ecology, and these things are kind of different. Ecology is the study of the interactions of all that life, the way in which the biology in a given area interact with one another. So there is crossover there, obviously, as biodiversity is included in ecology, but biodiversity largely refers to what is there and how much quantity and variety as opposed to how they interact with each other, which would be the ecology. So why is it important to soil? Well, I love analogies, so let's do an analogy. Uh, let's pretend that you want to build a city from the literal ground up, but in order to build a city, you need a lot of different tradespeople, from plumbers to construction workers to uh, electricians and farmers, just loads of different people with different skills doing different things. Well, the soil is similar. Uh, it needs a variety of different organisms that all offer different skill sets to make the soil productive. So for instance, uh, maybe some of the organisms like worms are really good at burrowing. So they bring in the sort of aeration element that the soil needs. Other organisms are good at foraging uh, for certain nutrients, like uh, maybe it's a specific bacteria or a fungi. So that's what they do. And maybe there are some microbes that produce a certain chemical called a secondary metabolite to ward off a virus. You want that great variety of tradespeople, in this case, beneficial organisms, uh, as much as possible so that your city, the garden, can be built properly, safely, robustly, productively, all those things. Not to mix metaphors, but that's exactly what I'm gonna do. But anyway, the biodiversity in your soil is your toolbox. It provides your soil with everything the soil needs to build healthy plants and then protect them. And you increase biodiversity by growing a diversity of plants, which themselves attract and feed their own diversity of microbes. You improve biodiversity by taking care of the soil, by disturbing it as little as you can, and feeding it a diversity of life-promoting substances like uh, different types of compost, for instance, and making sure it has moisture. Take all diversity out of a system and you make the system more vulnerable. 
Indeed, diversity is important in every aspect of life. Diversity of topics in a conversation, diversity of personalities in your friends groups, uh, diversity of life experiences and the people around you. Diversity makes us stronger as a whole. Diversity keeps things interesting. Diversity keeps things nerdy. And perhaps nowhere does this bear out quite like it does in the soil where without biodiversity, you mostly just end up with uh, sickly plants. Anyway, did I do it? Did I achieve an Ilioff explanation? Let me know how you would have explained it differently in the comments section. Otherwise, we're going to take a quick break. And when we return, is the term regenerative already dead? Just a small topic like that. Be right back. Today's episode is also brought to you by FarmRaise. Still using QuickBooks for your farm's bookkeeping? You're wasting time and losing money. Farm finances can be overwhelming, but they don't have to be. FarmRaise Tracks is the all-in-one tool built just for farmers. Manage expenses, prep for taxes, run payroll, and plan for the future without spreadsheets or stress. Just clear, organized insights to keep your operation thriving. Thousands of farmers trust Tracks to make smart financial decisions all year long. It's time you did too. Use code NOTILL20, that's all caps, no spaces, no till two zero for 20% off the life of your membership at farmraise.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Farmhand. I started a CSA to grow food and build community, not to drown in admin work. Spreadsheets, emails, and pack lists take up too much time. If I could spend less time at my desk and more in the field, that'd be a win. Enter Farmhand. Farmhand automates billing, newsletters, websites, and member support, saving CSA farmers 20-plus hours a week. Focus on farming, not paperwork. See how Farmhand can help. Book a one-on-one -on -one demo with founder Ari at farmhand.partners slash no-till. That's farmhand.partners slash no-till. All right, back to the show. All right, so I was at a conference not that long ago, and a conventional grower was presenting on their quote-unquote regenerative systems. This was a large-scale grower, very charismatic person, liked them a lot, uh, very thoughtful, but their systems looked like this. Every winter, they planted a cover crop. They would sometimes, or maybe always, I can't remember, graze that cover crop in the spring. Then they would spray that cover crop down with an herbicide just to make sure it was terminated. Uh, then they would plant their Roundup Ready beans or corn or whatever. Um, Roundup Ready just meaning it was genetically engineered to handle the herbicide and not die from it. And then maybe they would spray again in the spring. Uh, this person referred to their system as regenerative. The audience of large scale growers all kind of nodded in agreement, had no objections to that. Uh, the other day I was chatting with someone who was uh, discussing some growers they know as not organic, but they are regenerative, which I thought was a striking sentence as if to say regenerative is less than organic when for a long time it was thought of as more than, greater than, better than organic. Those two examples kind of uh, suggest a very interesting shift that has been frankly going on for quite a while. There is not, at least as I write this, a regulation as to what is and is not regenerative. So in a technical sense, you cannot argue you that what the person said they were doing is or is not regenerative. In fact, this same thing, albeit somewhat opposite, applies to no-till. A lot of older school growers still think of heavy herbicide applications when they hear the term no-till because, uh, you know, to a larger scale conventional grower, no-till means you burn down weeds, you spray them with an herbicide application and then drill in seeds with a no-till seed drill. In some cases, growers view this sort of no-till as worse than conventional for how much herbicide is required required to make it uh, work. On the one hand, I absolutely 100% prefer to know that growers are integrating animals and cover crops into their production rather than 
as we talked about in like the first segment, uh, leaving the soil bare. I think we can all agree, all of us who would indulge a podcast that calls you a nerd every day, that uh, should be the rule more than the exception when it comes to conventional agriculture. But my question for you is, should that be called regenerative when there are still herbicides, possibly pesticides as well, and genetically engineered seeds involved? How does that stack up in your mind to a, uh, to use myself as an example, a grower who does not use genetically engineered crops or any sort of sides, C-I-D-E-S, but uh, does it utilize large sheets of plastic for weed management? for instance. I think we all want growers to thoughtfully produce food uh, with as little or no chemicals as possible, but how do you feel about this shift in definition for the term regenerative? Uh, the grower whose talk I was watching could make the case, possibly with numbers, that they are actually improving their soil, maybe even building soil organic matter and microbial populations, effectively regenerating their soil. But what residue comes through on the crops that they're growing, who knows? Is that good enough knowing that the the end product would still likely contain some chemical residue for you? Anyway, I don't know that I have um, necessarily like strong feelings about this one way or another. Like I said, it's better than conventional bear following by a mile to me, but I'm curious to hear what you all think and how it strikes you to know this is the direction regenerative has been going and will likely continue to be headed until regulations are put in place. For as annoying as I sometimes found the organic regulations when we were certified all those years, and as much as I also didn't think that they went far enough to promote soil and ecological health, I definitely appreciated that the regulations themselves existed. Without regulations, people just make regenerative or whatever it is mean whatever they want it to mean, which is pretty much exactly what we are seeing now. Well, that uh, should likely kick the comment section off on a fun, exciting foot for the week, which is kind of a soccer reference now that I think about it. So that, that feels like an accomplishment. Otherwise, I'm going to wrap it up there. Don't forget, No-Till Growers is now officially a 501c3, so donations, well, they're tax deductible and greatly appreciated. You can learn more about that in the uh, show notes. Please make sure to like and subscribe and or follow wherever you're getting this podcast. That's an easy way to help us out. Enormous thank you to all of our show sponsors. And if you'd ever like to sponsor this show, you can reach out to Farmer Michelle at notillgrows.com. Huge shouts to Willie Breeding for the theme music, Mike Hilbert for the production help and the editing, and the team at No Till Growers for their support. Also, shouts to Epidemic Sound for the background music that you can hear. No matter. Pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook by myself or the Seed Farmer by Dan Brisebois at notillgrowers.com to support our work. Big, big thank you to everyone over at patreon.com slash notillgrowers where at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, or you sign up in May, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs today to unfortunately no one, no new signups or bump ups over the weekend, which is actually first time that's happened in quite a while so uh so no story today which is all good hopefully we will get one rolling for tomorrow otherwise until then thanks for watching and or listening we will see you tomorrow bye in the end what i found was no